We are super excited to bring you a broker panel discussion about the recent NAR settlement changes and best practices, and that's what we're going to do today. Let's get into it on the WBNL Wandering Without Loss podcast. And now your host, Jen O'Brien and Matt Emerson. Welcome, everyone, to the WBNL Wandering But Not Lost podcast, where together we align, connect, and prosper. This is episode 306. You can find all those show notes over at WBNLpodcast.com. Jenna Bryan, NAR, what the hell? Yeah, well, we've been talking a lot about it. We've been promoting the fact that we're going to have some three three amazing brokers that have been on the show before, but representing uh, three different states, and we're going to really get through what's been happening. It's only like a little past a week if that even, almost a week into the changes, but it depends. We're going to find out, you know, here in Nevada, we've been doing this since the 1st of August, actually, which is kind of good. I think it's gotten people a little used to it. So we're going to get in and we're going to dive in and we're going to ask the questions and we're going to find out from our panel how things are going and get the best advice from them. So stay tuned. We're hoping that you walk away with some great insights on how to make these practice changes how to work on your mindset and some best advice to move forward and really, really thrive in this new environment. That's right. All right. Well, let's just let's just cut to the chase and bring our guests in. We're going to bring them in one at a time here. And remember, I'm going to do a short bio on these guys uh, so we can get started with the uh, the conversation today. But if you want to get more information about all these brokers, we have links to uh, their uh, their information, how you can actually contact them if you are in their state and want to get a little more information from them personally. All that information is over at the show notes at WBNLpodcast.com. And once again, this was episode 306. First, I want to bring in Bob Bronswick from Colorado. Colorado. Uh, Bob's the managing partner at Realty One Group Premier, Lone Tree, Colorado. Uh, Realty One Group Premier uh, quickly established itself as the fastest growing independent brokerage in Denver, the Denver metro area. And in May of 19, or excuse me, not 19, I'm, that, I'm going back too many years, uh, 2017, the partners agreed to sign a 10 year extension with Realty One Group for the exclusive rights to the entire state of Colorado. And they've expanded their brokerage to 12 offices and they're creating franchise opportunities across the state uh, for, uh, you know, strategically. Uh, uh, minded operators around there. So welcome to the podcast studio, Bob. Thank you. All right. From <laughs> California, we have Lori Namazi. Lori Namazi is the founder of Namazi Real Estate Resources here in Orange County, California. Her boutique uh, consulting firm provides operation and risk management. Huh, interesting concept for today. Uh, uh, advisement and business coaching to independent brokers nationwide. She was a 2021 Orange County Realtors president with over 1,500 members, is both a California and National Association Realtors director, and is on the 2024 executive committee at the California Association of Realtors. She might have have a little bit of knowledge of what's going on with California forms. And then lastly, let's bring in, but never least, our friend David Squire from, uh, as I think he put it, Vegas baby. Uh, he's yes. a manager of Caldwell Bank Career in uh, Realty in Las Vegas, and as a top producer and leader of a mega team, uh, corporate uh, broker, uh, owner, personal coach, David understands that business uh, at every level and uh, how parties are, uh, all the parties are integral to the end game, uh, and that the ability to unite people as partners is his uh, kind of his magic power. So, welcome everyone to the podcast studio. I'm looking forward to our conversation today. Absolutely. And as a quick setup and as a reminder, in case you've been living under a rock and you weren't aware of the practice changes from the NAR settlement, effective per the settlement on August 17th and different maybe in each state, it definitely was in our state, effective uh, July 31st. Here are the two things that changed, okay? And this is important to set this up because there is definitely a lot of misinformation that came yeah. from the media. Yeah. From people, but also from real estate agents and brokers having wrong information about all of this. So we're, as a reminder, the two big things that changed effective is number one, NAR affiliated MLSs can no longer show offers of compensation to buyers agents in the MLS or any related MLS tool or service, etc. And number two, prior to showing buyers homes, agents must have a written buyer brokerage agreement that discloses the commission and how that commission can be paid. That's basically, in a nutshell, the two practice changes. Now, with all that misinformation and disinformation, there's a couple things that are happening that are to the positive, I think, to the real estate industry is that the news cycle is so quick these days, and we have so much going on with the presidential election, 
that back in March or whenever this was all announced, there was a little bit of a little bit of uh, media attention on it, and that's where I think a lot of the misinformation came from. But we're finding, and I can't wait to talk to all the brokers here, that the uh, people we're talking to, the sellers and buyers, don't even really realize that this happened, or maybe they remember something happened, or they heard something wrong, like the law changed, and uh, I no longer have. You know, you, we hear all these things, so we want to talk about that. And the last thing that I want to say is, we know for sure, and this is where if you're listening. You don't want to mess around with this, okay? Because there are people being trying to be super creative and look for workarounds. If you haven't been reading the news, you need to be aware. Not only is, are the plaintiff's attorneys for this main case, the Sitzer Burnett case, but all the other cases that were out there, they're looking and they're watching and they're doing things like I was listening to the Florida, I'm licensed in Florida, the Florida uh, attorney. Uh, speak on this and saying that there are people that are acting as agents in forums and doing things, you know, where agents are speaking, looking for evidence of non-compliance. Plus, the Department of Justice is definitely watching, right? So with that set up, it's all about are we being compliant? Are we following what the, you know, the, the, the feeling and the what we agreed to do as an industry per, you know, NAR representing everybody. So with that as a setup, I want to just jump in and we're going to go through a series of questions and we just excited to hear what everybody has to say. So we'll start with Bob and we're just going to ask this question down the line. How has the, the rollout of these changes happened for your, for your company and for Colorado? Can you just talk to that? And if you have, you had any challenges or just tell us how it's gone and did you do it in on the 17th or have you, did you start earlier? Well, we started earlier and we were um, asked by the um, our current MLS, RE Colorado, to try to start early, but it went into effect on, on, the, on the 17th. So we've been doing a lot of education. I think CAR has done, uh, Colorado Association of Realtors has done a, a nice job of um, through their legal team of kind of going through the process and putting it on YouTube and all that. Um, so I think the rollout went okay. We've been really educating our um, agents uh, for the last probably three weeks. Um, you know, there was a, a, obviously a new contract uh, purchase agreement that came out along with the, the other forms. Um, and so I think the rollout has gone well. Um, I, I've not had any calls uh, or very few with regards to questions regarding it uh, with new contracts that have come in. I think the bigger question is if, if I have a listing agreement, do I need to change it um, and things along that line. But other than that, I think it's been fairly smooth. Um, I was on a call the other day with um, our MLS and I was a little shocked at some of the broker owners um, that I think have turned kind of a blind eye and just really haven't been paying attention or reading. Um, and some of the questions they were asking, you know, you would think it was coming from a brand new agent, but you know, we, we got to take it serious. It is what it is. And um, we just got to move forward. And, you know, uh, for us here in Colorado, I think we've had a little bit of an advantage because the commissions or compensation, should I say, success fees have always been negotiable. Um, and especially within our platform, our agents have had the ability to negotiate. Um, so I think we're pretty well um, positioned here. Um, it's just a matter of the agents getting used to, you know, maybe just a little bit different language and, and really communicating more with their clients. Hey, a quick follow-up question. Have you personally had anyone uh, come back as, as you've been educating your agents and come back and say the seller, you know, like the seller is refusing to do this or that or, or any misinformation that they've had to, you know, like how have, have you helped your agents with any challenges where, you know, they're just like, I don't have to pay the commission or I don't want to, you know, are you right. working? Yeah. And, you know, we, we, we've scripted things out for them. So I, you know, so there's talk tracks for them. Um, not one, I've not gotten one call um, from somebody saying so seller doesn't want to pay. Um, so I think, you know, part of it is education. I think part of it is a seller saying, why wouldn't I, you know, our, um, sure. our inventory on the listing side has increased dramatically. I think where this question will come up more is if rates drop um, uh, and buyers get off the fence, um, I think we'll see compression. I think that's just going to be a natural thing. Um, but we'll, we'll see. We're, we're just going to continue to do business um, as we did and follow, and follow the rules. 
And, and one other question. In Colorado, in your area, were you using buyer brokerage agreements? We did. They were kind of a little bit taken lightly. And oftentimes, okay. I think agents had that fear factor of asking somebody to sign okay. something where, where you know, a, a buyer could have some responsibility on the compensation side. Um, and oftentimes, they were just getting signed at the closing table. And it was more of a fear factor than, than anything. So... And that's the big change, isn't it? So we're going to get into right. that too. Okay, awesome, Bob. That's great. And Lori, how about for your area? And I know you're. You can just tell us where uh, anything that you have from your experience of, of uh, being involved in uh, CAR and everything as well. Sure. Thank you. So I'm in California, and our California Association of Realtors, also called CAR, C-A-R. Um, so I'll be sure to make sure to say it's California <laughs> uh, to avoid confusion. But um, we've been very proactive since the settle since the the verdict came out, and then of course when the settlement came out, then everybody jumped into action to see what what are all of the changes and. We have, um, you know, officially implemented all the changes actually prior to August 17th, simply because all of our forms changed on July 24th. And then the MLS changed um, at multiple change dates, depending on which MLS you were on. And even the largest one in the state had two different dates, depending on which of their platforms you use. So we now have, you know, form change date, MLS change date, settlement date is later. So we had this confusion of an interim um, time frame that is really um, was a lot of confusion. We have obviously the modification forms, and people were unclear: Do I need the modification forms now, or can I just wait? So that caused a lot of confusion. But um, you know, we in California are known for our forms. We are known. <laughs> having probably the most lawsuits in this in the country so we obviously have a ton of forms and we had something like 20 forms that were changed now when agents hear that they panic but I've distilled it down to really three changes because the settlement outlined 13 changes, but most mm -hmm. of the states, you know, some of those were interrelated and most of the states adopted some of those things in practice, in law or, or in practice years ago. So for California, it was really the two changes that Jan outlined, but we actually had a third change and that was that, um, buyer agent uh, compensation would not be in our listing agreements. So the settlement does allow for it. However, our state chose to eliminate that in our contracts to be proactive, to be forward thinking, because we do anticipate that's where the Department of Justice is going to take us. So let's just do it now. Um, unfortunately, that has caused a little bit of a divide in our state. Some people are very upset that, you know, we are going beyond what the settlement requires. But we did have the Department of Justice weigh in on our initial draft forms back in June. And mm -hmm. they said, hey, good, but not good enough. And when we look at the letter of the settlement versus the spirit of the settlement, our state opted to say, you know what, we think we're going to take that next step and eliminate compensation for the buyer agent in the listing agreement altogether now. And we'll probably get there. It's just a matter of when. Lori, is there a, is there in that listing agreement? Cause David can speak to the fact that we've, we had done that already. So that's mm -hmm. interesting. Is there any language in the listing agreement for California that mentions that a buyer's agent may ask for compensation? Cause we have that in our new form here in Nevada. Is there any mention of if it is, it has to come in as a separate agreement? We, we do, we do have a, um, a negotiable term in our purchase contract where a buyer can ask for the seller to pay their obligation, the buyer's obligation of that compensation arrangement between the buyer and the buyer's agent. So they can ask for a general concession if they want, that's one line item, or they can ask for the seller to pay the buyer's obligation. We have a separate form for the seller, which is an MLS addendum that explains um, you, can, you, you may offer a concession and here's what a concession might look like. It could be a buyer's closing cost. It could be a home warranty. It could be um, your obligation to pay your buyer's commission. 
So we're still using both terms. We're using compensation. We're also using concession, but they're not really interchangeable. And a lot of the mis you know, misinformation is that concession is the new compensation, and that's not correct. Concession is a payment from seller to buyer, and buyer can choose what they use it for. They choose to use it for the buyer's agent fee. They can't. I like that word, success fee. Uh, that's a new one I hadn't heard before. Um, and in that MLS addendum, it also explains, you know, that you can you can indicate in the MLS that you're willing to consider a concession, but it doesn't give you a space to negotiate what that actually looks like. So wait a minute, are you saying that in your MLS, there is a seller concession field? So or, I was or, to, or, a, to a form that, that mentions that. Um, the form mentions seller, you know, would you be interested in entertaining a concession? Yes or no. And then yes, in our MLS at time of listing entry, there's that same question. And and it might be worded slightly different, but essentially, because I haven't looked at it wow. um, since it changed, essentially it says, is a seller open to a concession? Yes or no. And that's all you get. And yes if you or no. Anything, as far as a dollar amount or a percentage or wink, wink, how many cookies or any other yeah. cre creative thing, um, it's an automatic $2,500 fine. There's no warning wow. to remove no. it. It's just, you will get issued the fine. Before we go to David, Bob, just on that point, is there mm -hmm. anything in the MLS that's similar to that with concessions or is it like we're doing in Nevada? There's absolutely nothing. Yes, no, yes, no. They took everything right. out. Yep. As a matter of fact, they took everything <laughs> out and <laughs> seller sold concessions. So right. I'm, I'm going to ask Lori about that, but how about in, in a, and then I will go to David, how about in when you sell a listing, can the listing agent put whether or not the seller paid any concessions? No. Wow. Okay. And then Lori, will you just, will you speak to that? What happened in California regarding sold listings? Yeah. So they, they modified our sold concession field because people were not using it properly. They just didn't know what to put there, quite honestly. So now there's a drop down and it gives you different options and, and you identify how much and what it was used for. Yeah. So here in Colorado, they removed all historical information. So there is no access to any type of prior compensation. Wow. And are you getting, uh, you know, the calls to your agents? Like we are of, uh, you know, appraisers calling agents wanting to know if there are, there are concessions. Uh, they don't have a choice. I mean, that's, that's, that's what it, yeah. Yeah, we, we're fortunate. We've got a couple of appraisers that are also licensed agents. And so at our last meeting, they talked about that. And, you know, it's hard enough for them to get return calls. And so yep. it's going to oh be, God. yeah, it's just uh, we're, we're hoping and praying that agents will cooperate with these, you know, with the appraisers. It's going to be more important. Yes, you know, when there's going to be a, if there's going to be a concession, right, are they going to increase the purchase price in order for the seller to, you know, use that uh, concession as part of the success fee, right? So it's going to throw things out of whack. So it's going to take a lot of communication for sure. Okay, cool. So David, let's talk about how it rolled out for you, for your brokerage and for what you're, what you're seeing. Yeah, we uh, in Nevada rolled it out early, or certainly in uh, Las Vegas, greater Las Vegas area, we rolled it out early. Of course, we um, we removed the fields from the MLS first, and there was actually a countdown. And it was interesting with that countdown, some of the feedback on that. Uh, I actually had an agent say that their clients were looking at properties with them in a buyer consultation saw the countdown and was concerned for them and said, oh my gosh, they're going to take your money away. <laughs> Is, uh, you know, I hope I can help. And uh, it was interesting, you know, the that public perception of how that was counting down like that. Uh, we did get a head start on it. We rolled out early. Obviously, um, uh, some confusion there. There's already been a, uh, a couple changes to those forms. So revision, revision, uh, and and there will continue to be. We're prepared for that. We know that that's what's going to happen moving forward. So, yes, we did get a jump on it. Um, in terms of using the buyer's brokerage agreement, which is now the BBRA, the buyer brokerage representation agreement, 
we in our market have always had it available uh similar to bob's point i think what has limited a lot of agents from using it is that fear factor as you mentioned and and so we see we've always seen that uh, my brokerage has you know it has just been staple for our brokerage and so we've we've taught it from the very beginning that it's it's a tool that you use and in fact jan you and i have spoken about this um well prior and, and that was we have been using it as an instrument to negotiate on behalf of the buyers for commission on a buyer on, on a, a situation where the listing was offering one percent and the buyer was had a, a BBA for two and a half percent, we would use that buyer's brokerage agreement as an instrument to negotiate. And you couldn't ask for commissions in the RPA like, like we can now. However, we have been using that in that uh, fashion for quite some time to, to uh, a, a pretty high level of success. Yeah. So it's kind of nothing has changed now, not bury your head in the sand, nothing has changed. It's it's business as usual for us certainly um you know but jan we talked about this you know it's uh, for us it's obviously education first you know we know that knowledge is power the more you know about it uh the more prepared you are to talk about it you're not going to hide from it uh, certainly no knee-jerk reactions we don't want that um and uh and Jen, it, to your point earlier, um, yes, it was mentioned in the news, but there's really not a lot of talk about it. You know, I have a few agents that mentioned that a seller heard that they don't have to pay commissions anymore. And, you know, we've had those discussions, but ultimately the agents that, that know their scripts, they know their dialogues and objection handlers know how to show the benefit to their sellers and buyers uh, are, a, are su very successful. So so the changes, yes, um, were, uh, you know, there's three major forms that changed for us. Certainly the, um, the BBA, formerly BBA, now BBRA, it has a lot more options in it. One of which is showing a particular property or particular properties, uh, so on and so forth. So, so it's broken out quite a bit more. Certainly the listing agreement has changed, uh, clarifying that uh, that commission or potential concession to buyer's agent and uh, of course in the rpa now we can ask for compensation for the buyer's agent in the rpa so it's uh it's a little bit of a mixture between uh both um uh, colorado and california certainly we're paying attention to what california does because we know that a lot of that is going to <laughs> end up flow to us or, or it certainly has in the past so so that's kind of the big picture but it's business as usual and you know the, i think the big thing is being educated knowing how to talk about it and then now more than ever focusing on what we've always talked about jen we've coached this for years is we need to constantly be working on our skills no matter what's going on in the market right. so right now it's it's so critical that we stay educated we're all learning based people we get that right all of us we we, we understand that we have to stay learning based we have to constantly learn and grow and and accept change and embrace change so staying learning based having better scripts and dialogues to be able to talk about it and not be scared of it also um we need to improve our our um, our presentation skills now more than ever we need to improve our negotiation skills now more than ever so this is a for us, it's kind of business as usual. We've kind of been doing it this way, but now it's focusing, hey people, what we've always said, focus on your skill sets and that will get you through it. So listen, so I, I don't, I didn't do this in the prep, but I know you guys are all up for this. So I'm gonna do it with David first, but we'll, I think our listeners would benefit from this the most. And that is, we'll, let's do a couple role plays on this. Okay, a little scenario, all right? So like, I'm gonna be your agent and let's just focus on work because I want to talk about what to talk with sellers, like how you're how we're educating our agents to talk to the sellers about mm -hmm. how we're now doing it. So let's just start with the buyers first. OK, so mm -hmm. so I want to just do this, that you're you are I'm the buyer and I want just walk me through how the scripts and dialogues that just a little bit that you're using with in a buyer consultation, you're teaching an agent on how to bring up how things have changed. So, hey. Um, I want to go out and look at some homes today, David. Um, thanks for taking my call. Uh, when can we go look at homes? Or I'm um, in your house. I'm in, I'm in your office. When, we, when can okay. we go out and look at some homes? Here are the three houses I like to go see. 
Great. Okay. So if you're in my office, you've, uh, we've probably already gone through now you, we've blown this out considerably, you know, just like a listing, this is a listing appointment, just, just like right. a buyer's appointment is just like a listing appointment. Now, right. We are interviewing for the job. So we have already done the uh, pre-qualification questionnaire with the buyer ahead of time when, whenever possible. Okay. There's the occasional, we want to see one property. That's where we get uh, a one property uh, BBRA signed. However, typically, by the time you're in my office, you've already had the pre-qualification discussion. We've already sent out a pre-listing slash pre-buyer consultation package to set expectations. Now we're in to my office and we are going to do the formal consultation we sit down we do the consultation go through the process the steps just like we've always done um, show value connect with our, our our clients and at the end of that um, consultation before we get out and get looking at properties let's talk some business first we start obviously with the duties owed we go through the duties owed which obviously uh, shows them our um our commitments to them right? Our fiduciary responsibilities, so on and so forth. And then just like we always have, we go into the BBRA and we say, okay, and this is where we ask for the same commitment from you. You know, we're going to give you our, uh, you know, our best essentially. And we're asking that you are, uh, are loyal to us as well. And so we go through it and we say, if you, you know, we explain page by page, the options, and we say, and of course there is a section on compensation and we want to discuss that here are the options so and then we explain that um there's just like we always have that um if you buy a property from someone else you could be liable for commission if you buy a, go into an open house if you go to a new home all of those things and um and uh and we are also going to now the rules have changed a little bit you may have heard we are also going to negotiate this is where our negotiation skills come in we are going to negotiate on your behalf from that seller if they're offering compensation or if they're not comp offering compensation to cover any potential commissions that you may be responsible for out of pocket and close and it's uh it's it's just like before it's 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 really not not a difficult discussion. Okay, so I and, and I want to jump in and go to Lori and just say, what would you add to that? And then what is your feeling about part of the settlement was very specific language was you can't um, change it. You can't like, in other words, we're taking the interpretation that if we put X in the buyer uh, commission, we sit down with somebody and we agree and we negotiate X, we can't change it up later. I mean, maybe the interpretation is you can if you now, you know, disclose that. But my interpretation is X and I can go down. What's your thoughts on that? And can you add anything to what David's language would be and, and what maybe your, your uh, you know, uh, your coaching agents on what this broke agents and brokers what to say? Definitely. So the, the settlement was pretty clear. You can't get paid more than you've contracted for. And so to your point, you know, you can't. You can't receive more from the seller th than what your representation agreement from the buyer states. Now, it can be modified over time as needed, um, but you need to be really careful that you're not taking advantage of your client. You're not being perceived as taking of your advantage of your client simply because more is being offered. We have a fiduciary duty to our clients. We have a code of ethics that specifies put your clients first, not yourself. And so, you know, people have asked me, can I change it if I find out that more is being offered? I said, well, technically you can, but should you? You know, just because you can doesn't mean you should. You need to think about it, you know, is this in the best interest of your client? And does that persuade you to try to fight harder to get that house because of the commission that's being offered, which is part of what got us in this trouble to begin with. So I would well, caution you, ahead. you know, the, um, the sentiment of, well, uh, sellers offering less than, than I've contracted with my buyer. Well, that's a personal choice, whether you choose to hold your buyer to that differential. Mm -hmm. You know, that's a personal choice. I've had some agents say, well, I have a contract with them, so absolutely I would. And others would say, you know what? No, I'll, I'll, I'll be okay. You know, I'll, I'll negotiate down for it. 
Um, it becomes. Do you think it becomes a case by case on what the situation is, and, and mm -hmm. we're going to negotiate that way? So let me ask you a question: Does California have a way? Like, how are you working on modifying it down? So, you know, we let's just for the sake of throwing a number in there, uh, it was a three. Okay, I'm working. I'm going to work for three percent. That's what I've decided is what I'm worth. Okay. And I go, I go through the whole conversation and then we go in and we negotiate, we put it in the purchase agreement and they come back and maybe they counter that. And it's now 2.25 or whatever. If we, if we decide, if I decide that I'm going to change that, is there a form? Like, I, I think there needs to be some type of an amendment or something to it, or do you do a new form? What are you doing? What are you saying? If you go down, I get, we're all clear. You can't go up. Yeah. Right. Um, but what do you do to my, so in California, anytime anyone asks, is there a form for that? The answer is always yes. There is a form for it. <laughs> because we have a very proactive standard forms committee of a dozen or so practitioners who've contemplated all the scenarios, you know, and certainly, well, maybe all is a strong word, but they've contemplated as many scenarios as possible. So we absolutely have a we had a singular modification of terms form that was generally used for the listing side. Now we have one for the listing side and one for the buyer side because we do have different scenarios where we've got to modify, uh, we might modify our agreement with the buyer. So buyer representation agreements were available for decades in California, but not widely. And so we, you know, this is, this is a learning curve for all of us on these contracts. So David did a great job of explaining, you know, the, the same things we've been talking about here. It's you've got to educate your buyer on what their, um, what they are going to receive from us, because this is a complicated transaction. I, I love the saying when people say, oh my gosh, it's so much paperwork. And my response to that is, have you ever heard the phrase, it's like buying a house? Well, guess what? You're buying a house. And so nobody, you know, squawks at the, the pack from the lender that's this thick. Everyone just like, oh my God, and signs. But they always seem to hate our, our forms. Maybe it's because they trickle in. We've got a batch and then nothing and then another batch. But the reality is, you know, part of our, part of what I'm coaching on is our value proposition really lies in the risk management in protecting that buyer and so the form is there to educate the buyer and so we need to be able to explain that when you are about to receive a stack of forms like this related to the house and not the loan we're there to guide you through that so um, in terms of anything i would add to what he has been saying um, there's there's not really a whole lot that I would have added because he really covered it very well. I would just emphasize even more the fact that a buyer looking at all of these documents on their own will have no clue what it means. And there is a lot of redundancy because we restate things over and over to make sure they get it. And if they simply just initial and sign, they're missing it. So um, I think he did a great job covering that. And um, that's I love it. Uh, so adding, so going through the, the explaining what has changed, how compensation can be paid. Lori, you're talking about, you've got to cover, we've got to do a better job as an industry and individual agents in showing what it is that we do, the value proposition, which I think has been lacking. Maybe more listing agents are better at doing that. And that's kind of the concept, right? You, you, you really got yourself mm -hmm. ready for listings and you really showed what you're going to do to market their home and you really show your experience and all of this. You got to do the same thing with the buyer. I feel like I've always done that, but not everybody does because there was always this, I'm going to get paid because that's the rules that we've had for years and years mm -hmm. and years. And there's been some number that's been negotiated that the listing agent is sharing uh, so, Bob, I want to switch to, to talk to you about go right into sellers, because that's the big difference, right? We go out to take a listing now. It is for years and years, we've always negotiated, commissions have always been negotiable. Individual agent negotiates with the commission, with the seller, and then offers some portion of that negotiated commission in the MLS, which is what has significantly changed. Mm -hmm. Now we go out and we're going to just negotiate the commission with that seller for our services as their seller representation through our company. But what are you coaching your agents on how to have that conversation with, you know, that's what it was. 
the reality is we may have offers of that. So what, what are you doing in helping your agents understand how to how to negotiate the change? There? Frankly, I think it's easier on the seller side, but we do have to have that conversation to be prepared. So you're yeah, advice. I mean, Jen, it's the same thing, right? It's it's I think what we've always done here and we've always instructed our agents to do is to explain to the seller exactly how compensation works and what offerings are there. You know, does are there going to be cowboys and are there going to be people that say, absolutely, I, now that I don't have to compensate, I won't? Absolutely, that's going to be there. And so, you know, part of it's going to be is, you know, obviously that, that um, uh, the buyer's agent is going to reach out, you know, via phone to the listing agent, say, is there any offer of compensation? Um, you know, otherwise is, you know, is it, I think explaining to somebody, you know, in an open market, you know, getting more people through that property is going to be the biggest part of getting you the best price possible, right? And so will buyer agents reach out to me as the listing agent and say, is your seller offering some compensation? And the listing agent may say no. They may not show that property, right? They just may not show it. We we don't know what that discussion is going to look like telling the seller that, but you know, we may lessen the amount of traffic that comes through the property. Um, so that will be part of it, um, you know, part of that discussion. Do I personally think that a seller is not going to offer compensation and try to net 3% more? No. I mean, they would, most of them are saying what I'm, what I'm hearing from our agents is, why wouldn't I offer some type of compensation, right? So, so Bob, are you saying that in your Colorado forms, the new purchase agreement does not have a place to to request, you have to write it in, or is no? It, does, it doesn't in, in the listing agreement. It, it does have it. No, I'm saying in the purchase agreement. In the purchase agreement, it's going to come down to um, what they call additional provisions, and so that's where the hmm. where where the compensation. But it's not boilerplate saying the buyer is asking that the seller compensate hmm. their, their agent. See, Nevada has that. California. Is there a, a okay? Is that yeah, and, and again, it's it's a work in progress. So I think uh, as it goes it along, I'm sure it's going to change it, and might have already changed today. I mean, so um, <laughs> you know, from that aspect of it. But yeah, I mean, it's it's um, it, it'll be interesting moving forward to kind of see. You and, know, it, the, and it is a work in progress, and we're going to all figure, and everybody's watching and seeing what's going on because it's interesting. You know how we're how I'm uh, kind of coaching people too, or how we're dealing with it because I'm out selling. Is if a, if somebody calls to ask that question, I still think you have to call as a buyer's agent. You need to know if there's other all the normal stuff. Are there other offers? You know what is there anything you could tell me that's going to help? You know <clears> that, the, <throat> that the seller wants so we can write the best possible offer. I'm always going to do that. Generally, maybe the compensation you know question may come out that they're open to that. And I think the, a good answer for listing agents is simply. Are you offering? So I'll reverse it. Are you offering? Is your seller offering compensation? I don't know. I haven't seen. We haven't seen your offer yet. Mm -hmm. Why don't you present your best offer? Because unless you're going to tell me every term and everything that you're doing, we need to support right. it. I mean, I think ultimately, it's almost like what I think is going to happen over time is it used to be over here in the MLS. We're going to mm -hmm. educate everybody to the point you're saying, Bob. It's now over here in the purchase agreement. Unless, to your point, Bob, and when we get into a crazy potential seller's market if we uh, don't have enough inventory increase and we have tons of buyers jump in when we get into the fives right. and interest rates. And now there's multiple offers on every house now it's going to be interesting because yeah. now we're going to, now that play is going to be are you you know are you writing a competitive offer that's not asking for compensation because right now in all our markets you just mentioned that Lori in the markets that you're working in is there inventory increasing is there homes sitting on the market that need you know renovations and stuff what's happening in California where you work. Yeah, so low inventory, just like everywhere else, but we've seen a slight increase in inventory, which has created longer days on market, not not substantially longer, but slightly longer. That does give a buyer a greater choice and greater room for negotiation. And so, you know, when the markets change, we see buyers' offers looking different. I mean, I've been in the business 22 years now. I remember the day where we were, we were offering, the buyer was offering to pay the seller's closing costs. So we will see right. different things. And that's why I think it's important. You know, you, you touched on this, Jan. I think it's really important to let buyer's agents know it doesn't matter until you submit an offer. 
So submit your offer. The seller's going to look at all the terms. They're going to look at price. They're going to look at number of days for closing. They're going to look at number of days contingencies, and they're going to look at anything you're requesting, anything you want the seller to pay for. Used to be just, you know, government retrofits and, you know, their portion of the title. Now it's going to, now it includes potentially compensation. And so I think the conversation for both your buyers and your sellers with both your buyers and sellers, you have to set the expectations and I kind of call it the choose your own adventure. So seller, you have these multiple options of, of, of how compensation, how you can offer compensation or not buyer. There are these different options. It doesn't matter until the two come together because seller might want option a buyer might want option B, but guess what? If that doesn't work, A and B is going to equal C. So it's going to be negotiation. So I think we set the expectations with both our buyers and sellers. And the reality is a seller needs to look at the offer in totality, not just, you know, hey, they call me and they ask what the compensation is going to be. Because guess what? If I have pre-negotiated, which in California, you really shouldn't be doing. It's not illegal to do that, but our forms don't give us the opportunity to that to do that because we we believe the DOJ is going to say we're not doing that anymore so stop and mm -hmm. so you know agents need to stop trying to make it fit you know it's it's changed now but when the offers come in you know why would i commit my seller at this point in time why would i commit my seller to a certain dollar amount that they might not need to pay that mm -hmm. buyer that's right in the offer might actually say i've got plenty of money i'm going to pay it myself but I might offer a different sales price than what the list price is, you know? So you can't just give a blanket dollar amount anymore because you have to see the right. whole picture and every no. buyer is going to have a different scenario. Some are going to offer less than list price for whatever reason. Some will offer list price. Some will offer more and whatever the math works out, just show the seller. Here are the possibilities. Here's how the math looks out. And then let's wait and see what comes in. What will be interesting is, is right now what I'm hearing is when a buyer's, when the, when the buyer agent is calling the listing agent to see if there's any offer or compensation, the listing agent is asking what's in your buyer agent. agent. Yeah. That's exactly right. So yeah. Now we come down to a disclosure thing. Do, you know, is the buyer agent obligated to tell the listing agent what the buyer, what the, nope. feature, you know, what the compensation is going to be? And the answer right, Dave, is, is, is no. You know, commercial real estate has always been done this way. Right. right. Commercial real estate that's very a good point. has an offer of compensation. And so I think that's why, at least my experience has been that a lot more communication in a commercial transaction than usually typically been done uh, in a residential. But Jen, Jen, Jen? yeah, yeah, I do. <laughs> I mean, this is such great stuff. I mean, it's uh, you guys are just making some just really important points. You know, uh, of course, um, it's going to change, right? This is an evolutionary process. We know it's going to change. It's what it is today. You know, it's it's just like the market, though. You know, is the market this going to be the same six months from now that it is that, as it is today? Is it, was, is it different than it was six months ago? You know, is there anything we can do about it? No. The only thing that we can uh, control is how we react, right? But, you know, a couple uh, points. Um, uh, the, the, the seller you know, so there's some discussion with agents and it's, a, again, a little bit of fear, um, but the agents, you know, are having discussions about, oh my gosh, my seller says, I am not paying commission. I will not pay commission. I don't care what, I'm not paying commission. The new law says I don't have to pay I mean, that's, you know, I've heard that. And so I, here's a great scenario. Have you ever had a, a, a listing, a seller that says, this property is as is? I will not spend one dollar. I don't care what they ask for. I'm not fixing a single thing. Of course, the property inspection happens. The request for repairs come over, and they say, "All right, give them a fifteen hundred dollar credit." Right. So, so everything is negotiable. And kind of along Lori's point, I I, I like this uh, example as well. You, you made a really good point um, about so consider a seller's market versus a buyer's market, extreme sellers versus buyer's market, right? And Lori, you alluded to this by saying buyers in an extreme seller's market, what are they paying? They're paying above appraised value. 
they're paying uh, they're paying all the seller's closing costs. I mean, they're they're giving firstborn sometimes in an extreme seller's market. And, you know, we're protecting them because that's our responsibility. However, in order to get into the home they want in that particular market, that is what they have to do. Same thing applies on an extreme buyer's market, right? On an extreme buyer's market, the seller uh, is giving everything, right? They're paying everything for the buyers, any concessions they have to. So this will unfold as it will, right? And, and so this is just going to be a part of that you know looks have commissions in terms of the appraisal thing appraisers i i've heard a couple different ver versions from appraisers on how they're looking at this some appraisers are calling around trying to get as much information because to jan's point here we don't have that drop down that shows concessions so the appraisers mm -hmm. are on the phone they're reaching out to us they're asking questions some appraisers that i've spoken to are saying we don't care about the commission. The commission's always been there. We're going to leave that alone. All we're looking for is, was there a concession just like before that would have been listed in the MLS? And that's what we're factoring into our appraiser appraisals. Other appraisers are looking for the concession for commission. So again, it's murky. Okay, that, wait a minute. I didn't understand that. That is a great point because that's the point I've been making since day one. Prior to these changes, the offer from the buyer included the total commissions to be paid and the seller's closing costs, their normal closing costs, whatever the other terms were, less all that is what they netted, right? And Lori yeah. alluded to it too. And so I like what you're saying that some appraisers are going, the commission was always part of the sales price, right. all the commission. The, the buyers not were a financing. You yeah. can look at it that way, Jen. You can look at it like in, in the past, the buyers were just raising the sales price to cover the compensation and financing it into their loans. And that has always been a part of the purchase price, right? So the big question now is, and it's a question of concern, I think, and, uh, and that is, are we get, going to get to a point, if we're not clear on how this works, you know, now, so, if appraisers are, you know, if, if the banks and appraisers are allowing us to increase the sales price to cover that commission and we can come in with a stronger offer and it appraises, essentially the buyer is financing that commission over a long period of time, right? Makes sense. It's always been that way. If it doesn't appraise, then it's a different story, right? So so that piece of it, it's, it's built in there. And, uh, and so, and, and ultimately, realistically, think about it. What's the average home ownership? Five to seven years? How much of that commission are they going to pay back over five to seven years anyway if they finance it over 30 years, right? So you have to have a real discussion about that. If they raise the purchase price by 1%, the property appraises, they're going to finance that 1% over 30 years and pay probably five to seven years of it which is mostly interest anyway. So they're never really going to realize that full 1% unless they hold the home for 30 years, right? It's so it, let, let, we have to kind of wrap up here, but you know, one thing I think that is the, you know, when you talk about winners and losers or whatever, it's like semantics, we're changing some things, we're full disclosure, you know, we're being all up front. This really is going to sort out what I call the hobbyists, the people who've been, you know, th this is the one thing that I really do feel. For years and years, I feel like there's been a lot of buyer's agents that are out there that are a were able, you know, to ba basically show up, write an offer and get compensated something. Uh, you know, that I think is going to, this is going to weed out some of that. Mm -hmm. That plus, I think there are going to be people who feel that, I can do it for less because I really didn't do much anyway before because the other agent handled everything, right? So I think this is going to be interesting to see how it plays out. But the point I want to make and get your your uh, opinion on, I think the people that are hurt the most in this are those buyers that don't have a lot of money saved for uh, down payment and or to pay the commission if they had to, and if a market shifts and now to be competitive. I mean, let's face it, before the changes in, in the market we had coming out of COVID where houses were crazy because the interest rates were so low, they lost out. The the average, the, 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 the low to median, you know, home buyer who has just enough for three and a half percent FHA down payment was losing out on purchasing homes. Now we've got something added to that, which I think continues to allow other people who have more to buy more. And I just want to see if you guys feel the same way. And maybe there's going to be some programs that come out on that. Maybe they're going to, the, the, the federally backed 
mortgage companies are going to allow, um, you know, the 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 uh, homeowner to finance their commission, legitimately finance their commission as part of a cost. Anybody have any comment on that? Because I think that's the one thing that we're going to see in the long run is the person who's hurt is the, the yeah. guy. That, the guy you know, like Jan, I think you're, you're hundred percent correct. The first time home buyer, if there's a first time home buyer market, <laughs> you know, um, they're, they're going to be the one challenge. Right. And I believe VA and FHA have already allowed them to uh, mm -hmm. finance the commission. If need be, it's not permanent. It's just a temporary thing from what I understand. Um, so I, I don't know, you know, it's going to come down to concession and what they can qualify for. So I think mm -hmm. that pre-qualification is going to be super important so that they know. So maybe if they're looking at a $600,000 house, they have to go down to 550 if they're going to have to pay something. Right. Um, so it, that, that'll be a huge challenge for, um, for buyers with limited you know, down payments and, and limited qualify, um, qualification. Yeah. Anybody hearing anything else out there around those lines or, you know, no, we, have, you know we own a mortgage company as well. So, you know, we're, we're, we're teaching a lot on concession, making sure that they separate the concession for closing costs comparatively to the concession for, um, uh, for compensation. Yeah, which, I would which add that, that, I, go ahead, Lori. Why would I, I was just Sorry, I'm talking on top of you. I just wanted to get this one point in. I think what Bob mentioned, having a, a in-house lender, it's so critical to speak to your lender really always. But now it's almost like you've got to consult with your lender, with your buyer to really come up with the ways that you can make it all work. Should the buyer have to, because you have to know, can the buyer pay any, have enough with all the things that they need mm -hmm. to be able to do? And, you know, in talking to your, the lender has to talk to the agent. So as a team, you can go in and you can figure out what you have to negotiate. That's what I was mm -hmm. trying to say. Mm -hmm. Okay. So Absolutely. It's, it's I think we're on the same wavelength because that's that's what I was going to recommend as well. You know, I think when you're doing that buyer consultation, you have to you have to be real honest about what their capabilities are and reach out to their lender and say, look, if if we can't get a seller to pay all or some of the compensation that the buyer is now obligated to pay, what options do you have? And I think in terms of the, that buyer consultation, you know, I mentioned setting expectations, but have that, that conversation needs to be really in depth in terms of, look, if we find a home that doesn't meet your expectations, what would you like to do? Well, what do you mean? Well, if you're looking for a four bedroom and we find a three bedroom and a loft, does that meet your expectation? Oh, probably. Okay. Well, if we find a home where the seller's not offering to cover your obligation, or they're only offering to pay part of your obligation, what would you like to do? And so when you set that expectation ahead of time, you have those conversations ahead of time, no one feels blindsided when you write an offer and then get a counter back where the seller says, sorry, you know, not paying all or or, or any of, of that obligation. And so if you have that conversation with your buyer ahead of time, you know what to expect, and then you can go in and you can fight for them. You can fight for the house they want and fight to get that term, which is their ask to cover the obligation. You can fight for that term like you fight for any other term. Yeah, and uh, we, we suggest, yeah, we've suggested to our mortgage team to be available to sit in and buy our consults. And especially, you know, mm. we're not getting a lot of buyer consults in the office. So, you know, they're going to have to do a little bit of work, but they're all looking for business just like everybody else. And so until the market shifts, I think they have to put the time in, go with the agent. Um, it takes, I think it takes a lot of the weight off of the agent's shoulders in having that hard discussion when it is coming from somebody that is in charge of the financial part of the transaction. You know, it's funny. It seems like right now that net sheet, net sheet mastery is the uh, key to the whole, the whole game here, right? Yeah. That's exactly right. Yeah, but let's finish, let's finish up today. You guys, this has been some great, uh, you know, discussion, great advice, and it's really is part of learning curve. But we want to. I'm going to start with you, David, and just say, what is your best advice? for any real estate agent broker listening right now on how to move forward and just, you know, do well in this market, do well with these changes. Well, I, I think I kind of, I already said it, but ultimately it's uh, obviously education, education, knowledge, knowledge, understanding, scripts, dialogues, work on those skills, uh, presentation skills, negotiation skills. And uh, Lori said it several, several times and probably, because of your background, you're even more cautious about um, liabilities, right? And um, and that is 
set expectations up front because this could appear as if we are because we're going to see creative financing we're going to see a version of creative financing on the buyer side that's just just the way it's going to be we all are kind of talking about that now we have to be very cautious and the better we show our value and we set expectations up front open clear disclosure um the the less it's going to look like we are negotiating against our buyer's best interest right we're supposed to be negotiating for our buyers but we're raising their purchase price is that against against their best interest no so we have to show our value uh and 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 earn our success fee bob uh and and set expectations up front that i have unfortunately this is my career i have to get paid and we may be, need to be creative in the process and it may entail us raising that purchase price which would allow you to finance some of that into to the loan are you know are you comfortable with that so again it's setting expectations full disclosure right on Lori. anything to add yeah, no, that was great. And I would add to it that we need to just right now take things slow, understand the forms, understand the process, ask people, you know, hey, I, I think I got this, but can you just take a look at this form? Did I do it right? Or is am I am I reading this right? Am I understanding this? How do I move forward? Take it slow. Don't overcomplicate it. It feels like a million changes all at once, but as Jan mentioned, it's really two changes. In California, it's three changes, it's 20 forms, but I keep distilling down to my clients and, and when, I, when I'm doing trainings, it's really only three changes, okay? I like to look at things like that. I don't like to look at 20 changes, that's overwhelming. I look at the three changes. There's a lot of moving parts under each of those changes. So take it slow and be calm I have a very calming personality. So just be calm with it all and it'll all be fine. Exactly. Bob, final words of wisdom. Yeah, just disclose, disclose, disclose. I mean, having that open dialogue and having conversations is something that's gotten away from our industry. And it's going to take communication between both agents, right? Which the internet has really, and electronic contracts have really eliminated that conversation. So I think you know, hopefully most agents are taking this very, very serious and return and picking up their phones now instead of letting it go to voicemail and pick and choose what they want to return. Um, that the dialogue between agents is going to get greater and greater like it used to be back in the day before mm -hmm. we had all this technology. So, um, yeah, I, I think it's I, I don't know if it's great for our industry, but I think it's it's going to open up um, um, some opportunities for sure. Listing, 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 right? List the last and uh, all that fun stuff. To be a listing agent is really where you want to be. But um, yeah, I, we're looking forward to it. I, I just think that it's going to make, it's going to increase our professionalism. Yes, I, that's a great way to end it. Matt, any final uh, comments? No, I mean, I, I, you know, it's, it's great information that uh, everyone brought to the table today. And it, it's going to be interesting to see what happens in the future, right? And I, I'm telling you, you know, the Fed came out today talking about uh, the most aggressive and positive, you know, rate changes that uh, are in the future, which is, uh, you know, who, who knows what's going to happen right over the next few months. So it's going to be exciting to watch. All right. Well, thank you so much, guys, for taking time out of your busy schedule to share your insights and wisdom. We got a little difference in the states, which is the way it is. But remember, everybody listening, uh, even though we're sharing advice and whatnot, you always need to go to your broker in your area, in your state and follow their rules. OK, because as you can clearly see, there's our little nuances between each area. And I think there'll continue to be some. But then we'll 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 just get better and better as we move along. Right. All right. If you want more information about our guests, go over to our show notes at wbpodcast.com. This was episode 306. And until next time, be forever be wandering, forever wandering, but not lost. Ruby, thank you guys. You guys were awesome. Thank you so much. Really that was awesome. Great, great dialogue. All right. Thanks, Thanks for guys. sharing.